morning, good afternoon, and good evening to distinguished chairs and speakers, as well as to our audiences. We are back again with two great speakers for you today. The first speaker of today is no stranger to us. He is a very well-known personality and our honored guest from USA, California, Professor James Osman. Dr. Osman is now a clinical professor of neurosurgery in the Department of Neurosurgery, University of California at Los Angeles. He also holds the position of the clinical professor of neurosurgery at the Loma Linda University Medical Center in Loma Linda, California. He has visited many centers across the USA, advising them on strategic planning for the future in complex healthcare environments. Dr. Osman is recognized as a leading authority in neuroscience development. He has lectured on and is respected for his futuristic views in healthcare and neurosciences. Along with his wife, Carolyn, he has created and produced a television series for public broadcast stations entitled The Leading Gen, What Will You Do With The Rest Of Your Life? For the people from 50 years to 100 plus years of age, a program which was viewed by millions of people across America. Dr. Osman was the creator and editor-in-chief of Surgical Neurology, an international neurosurgical journal which began in the year 1994. Under his leadership, the journal rose to become one of the top three journals in neurosurgery. In 2020, Dr. Osman created and developed a new educational system, SNI Digital, based on the discussion and interaction between audiences and the speaker as an alternative to the virtual platform Zoom. Dr. Osman has published over 300 articles and book chapters, and he has been an invited lecturer at the national and international conferences in nearly, in nearly 70 countries. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker with us, and today he'll be imparting loads of wisdom for the young neurosurgeons in this very interesting topic titled, The Most Important Lesson I Learned in Medicine. The second speaker for today is our honored senior faculty from Japan, Professor Mitsuko Masse. Professor Masse is the director of Nagoya University Hospital and is also the professor and chairman, Department of Neurosurgery, Nagoya University, Graduate School of Medical Sciences. He adorns the position of director of the Emergency and Critical Care Center, Nagoya University Hospital as well. Professor Masse is an expert in the management of cerebrovascular diseases, endovascular treatment, endoscopic surgery, traumatic brain injury, and CSF physiology. He is a member of the board an instructor in Japan Neurosurgical Society and Japanese Society on Surgery for Cerebral Stroke. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and he will be talking about updates regarding CSF physiology, current options and future subjects. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Colombia, Professor Tito Parilla. Professor Parilla currently is a consultant neurosurgeon and spine surgeon at Hospital Infantil Universitario de San Jose. He is also the head of neurosurgery department at Hospital Clinic San Rafael and Professor of Neurosurgery and Spine Surgery at the Neurologic Institute of Columbia. He has more than 450 publications and oral presentations combined. He was the president of the Colombian Association of Neurosurgery and president of the Federation of Latin American Neurosurgical Societies. He was a member of the nominations and bylaws committees of the WFNS and a delegate for 28 years to the Executive Committee. He is currently the honorary president and co-director of scientific program of the WFNS World Congress, which is going to be held in 2022. He was a recipient of several awards during his vast illustrious career, including the gold medal of the flank and distinction of the Congress of Colombian Republic. We are extremely honored to have him today to chair the session of Professor James Osman. The second chair for today is our honored guest from Saudi Arabia, Professor Ahmed Ammar. Professor Ammar is a professor and head of department of neurosurgery at the King Faisal Health University Hospital, Dhamam, Saudi Arabia. He is a vastly experienced neurosurgeon who has conducted more than 6,000 surgeries. He has a special interest in pediatric neurosurgery. He has authored the most famous book in neurosurgery titled Hydrocephalus, What We Know and What We Still Don't Know. He serves on the editorial board of several internationally reputed neurosurgery channels. He is the recipient of several awards and other honors from the Saudi government for his outstanding contribution towards neurosurgery. He has decorated several academic positions in various internationally renowned organization during his long career. He, cur he is currently the co-chairman of the WFNS Ethics Committee. We are extremely grateful to him to have him today to chair the session of Professor Mitsuhi Tomase. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Kaito, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and the distinguished audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online platform to the first chair, Professor Tito Perilla. I would like to thank all of you and all organization committee of this webinar for giving me the, this opportunity to present to Professor Jane Ausman. He's a, a great neurosurgeon. He has been uh, with us working 
for at least 40 years ago when I met him at the University of Minnesota. So I, for me, it's a great honor to speak about some words from him. He is a real master of master in neurosurgery. I, I want to tell you why is the reason I say that. First of all, he beginning to work always with care, with love, for save the life of the patient. I can give testify of this situation. Always he think I'm putting all his beds for doing, provide better care to the people who was around of him and request to him for help. He started working in one difficult field of neurosurgery at that time, vascular, but vascular related with the stroke. And really he's the pioneer and he has the ability to see for 40 years ago, now the advances in how take care of that kind of patient that at that moment, no people take care of that. Neurologists, and neurosurgeons always go to make rounds and look that poor patients fell in one bed and nothing happened. Only give aspirin. And he started, introduced the concept of revascularization of the brain. And he will be fed for in that field. Yeah, I know he introduced the concept of the penumbra and how we can change that field. In, and now we will see the explosion in special in all development countries with the endovascular, how he has the reason at that time. But anyway, he put in all his effort, all his soul to push people, to give his hand to help others John Nebrosolis. Always. I also I can see here in Latin America from many years how how he helped the John neurosurgeons and pushed them to improve neurosurgery. He has been thousands of times over Latin America and he has been mem mentor of many neurosurgeons of each country of in Latin America and also or in I know in many co uh, regions like Africa and Asia and also Europe, even the United States, to he held with love, with care, with tender for improve his skull of his uh, knowledge in neurosurgery. And also, I can say that he spent almost 60 years of his life for care of the patient and academic career. Also, he has tried to push us to tell other people and share the knowledge for improvement. A minutes before I, I hear from him, we'll be learning in this conference, in this conference with each other. It's for that reason, all of us, all people, all neurosurgeons who are attending to this important conference will be thanks to all the organization for give us the opportunity to, to listen to him and learn from him. And Dr. Ausman, thank you. God bless you always because you are doing the best of your soul, of your nice soul. You have clean soul. You are very honest and dedicated to neurosurgery worldwide. Thank you for give even today with all tender and love that you always are giving to us. Thank you so much. 
And I can say for Finnish that you really are master of master. And you all young people must to see here like paradigm to fellow in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Tito, for the very nice things you said. I, I, I appreciate that very much. Well, uh, I appreciate, uh, first of all, being invited to talk to you. Uh, it's an honor for me to do that. It's a pleasure for me to see uh, Tito and Ahmed and uh, all the other people uh, who are here. Uh, I've had the pleasure and the, the good fortune to go to your countries many times and learned a lot from you. And we're going to talk about what are the most important lessons in medicine. I'm now 83 years old. And what are the important lessons I learned? Uh, and, and we will talk about that subject. First question, who are we? Who are we? The universe was started some 13 billion years ago. 13 billion years ago, we have no idea how things began. Uh, in various religions around the world, we attribute them to various gods. Whatever you believe in is correct because no one knows the answer. I think often when I see smaller animals or insects and I see what is the world that they live in, they don't understand my world. They don't understand your world, but yet they work and they do the things that they have to do to live and to survive. And they don't know. And we're the same. We don't know what happened before 13 billion years ago. And we're working and maybe we, we don't have the sense we don't have the understanding of what's in the world. Uh, we have a dog and the dog was barking a uh, half hour ago and I didn't see anything outside, but the dog has a different sense than what we have and knows somebody is there. What is that sense? Because we don't know it. We can only hear in a certain range of frequencies. We can only see in a certain way. We're lucky to be able to communicate, but do we know what's beyond? We don't know. The earth was formed four and a half billion years ago from gases and dust. And over time, eventually humans appeared on the earth and you can have different beliefs as to how you think that happened. We have strong beliefs that it was through evolution. There are other people who believe other things. People can believe what they want to believe. There is no right or wrong. We're trying to find out what the truth is, but we have to respect everybody's opinion and what they're thinking. And so about 500,000 years ago, humans appeared in the earth. They started out in Africa and they spread to Europe, they spread to the Middle East, which was Babylon in those times. It was where Dr. Uh, Amar is from. It's from that region of the world, which is a, a wonderful place to be. And they had, uh, th they were initially people who were hunters and gatherers. They didn't have time. They didn't have anything that we have today. And eventually they gathered, gathered around rivers. The Tigris and the Euphrates are the Mediterranean. And they formed groups called civilizations. And so we've had civilizations. I visited uh, Xi'an in China. I saw uh, they had unearthed a civilization that was 10,000 years old. Amazing accomplishments they had. Uh, our wonderful architecture. They had tunnels to take water. Uh, they had many advances 10,000 years ago. And how many years before that, thousands of years did it take to get to that point? 
and we started recording history some 3,500 years ago. And so we're, we're beginning to find out people started from Africa, they spread around the world, they spread to the Middle East, they went to Asia. At that time, the world was different, the land was connected, they came to North and South America, and everyone they changed, they had genetic uh, changes because of the environment and illness and disease. We know that species compete with one another and there is survival of those who can survive. And so the people who would survive, we have left in there all different colors, all different religions, all different everything, it doesn't matter. And here we are now starting from 10 to 50,000 years ago, beginning to have civilizations. We went through great periods and people don't know this. There were great advances in China four and 5,000 years ago, incredible arts. Uh, at that time, governments were basically a mon monarchies or they were ruled by rulers. Some were good and some were not so good. And then we came to Greece and to Rome. We came to, to Europe and we, we began to think about how we, we handle life. And people began to develop reason. That was not reason that just came from the church, but it was beyond that. And so now we're, I'm sitting here today in the United States and California, and I'm talking to people all over the world, instantaneously, electronically. I couldn't do this 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 100 years ago, and maybe even 10 years ago. And in the whole history of the universe, this comes to something that we need to feel, and it's a humility. Our civilization today is a mere speck, seconds in time of the whole universe. We will live, we will die, other civilizations will follow us. How are we going to live together? And so we're going to talk about what I've learned in living together. If you look at the population of our country now. In the gray part, this is a population by year. If you look in the gray part of the graph here, those are people over 80, that's me. If you look at people in the blue part of the graph, those are the young up to 20. And all the rest in the, in the, in the middle are the young people who are the young people, the people who are gonna be the, the face of neurosurgery in the coming decades, in the coming centuries. So I'm humble being asked to talk to you. I mean nothing, I'm a speck. If I tell you some things that are of value, fine. But this is the world you have to live in and this is you have to shape in the way you want to make it a good world. So we older people are passing to you the responsibility for this world and its problems. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the good. I'm gonna to talk to you about the bad. I'm gonna to talk to you about the problems. How do we solve those problems? Because these are issues that are fundamental before you become a neurosurgeon. These are fundamental to living. And if we don't understand that, we won't be able to live well. In all the history of civilization that's recorded 3,500 years, we've spent 3,300 years fighting with wars. 3,300 out of 3,500 years at war. Does that make sense? What do we gain from that? We need to think about those things. My wife and I have been privileged to be able to go to 70 countries around the world. Most of them have been low to middle income countries. 
We've been to the high income countries. It doesn't matter. When I went to these countries, uh, uh, people would take me and show me the, the great monuments or the great castles or the great churches. And I began to wonder how many lives were lost? How many people died making those monuments to some other human being? So I didn't want to see that anymore. I wanted to talk, we wanted to talk to the people. So we talked to the people in the farms, the poor people everywhere. We talked to people who are friends of you and me. And we would sit in the homes and we talk about important issues and how we're handling them. I've had dinner with the rich. I've had, I've had meals with the poor. And this is what we've learned. From people all over the world, most people, if not all people, love their family. They want to have the freedom to raise their family and do for their family what they want. And they want to have peace. Everywhere in the world, every country in the world, it was the same. Those are the people who come into your office. Now, in some countries, there are some leaders, and this is throughout entire history, entire history that we know of. Some leaders want power. They want to control your life. They want power. They want riches. They want you to do what they think you should do. And that is evening happening today in countries around the world. That's not what the people want. The people want what I told you. The patient wants what he comes to see you about. Take care of my family. The other people who want power are either mentally ill or or psychopathic, many of them are. They've killed millions of people. For what? What are you going to do about it? Well, the principle is that the patient should always come first. A patient comes to your office, he brings his family, either his child is sick or his wife is not, not feeling well or his his mother and father are sick, but he comes to you because he respects you, because you are a learned person. You know things that they don't know. You've been to school, you've been educated, and he wants to come to you for help. And when he shows up in the office, in your office, and he looks at you, He's putting the life of his family in your hands. You have his life in your hands. He's giving you that. What does he want in return? He wants you to know that he wants you to do everything you possibly can do to help his son, his daughter, his wife, his mother, his father, he wants you to do that. That's the contract he makes with you. Nobody ever has that contract. It isn't a hospital in the world where that contract exists. It is the most important contract in medicine. The hospital gives you contracts to sign and things you have to sign. It is nothing compared to this contract. And when you agree to take the patient, you have agreed to that contract. That's a bond between you and the patient. You will do everything you can to help that patient. That's been going on for all time, all humanity. The patient wants you to do that no matter what the hospital says, no matter what the government says, no matter what your colleagues say, he wants you to do the best you can do for him. That's nothing wrong with that. And you've agreed to do that. Does your hospital agree to that? I've been to hospitals all over the world. 
and in the United States? No, they don't. Does the government believe that? You know that they don't. Does your organization believe in that? Or are the people in the organization more important? I've seen this all over the world. You see it locally in your hospitals. What about personal issues? Some people want, want to go home all of a sudden. My father was in the hospital. All over the chart was written that he was allergic to narcotics. So at six o'clock at night, when they were changing shifts, a new doctor came in and gave my father some narcotics, had a disaster. Somebody didn't do their work. They didn't read the chart. It was right there. And as a result, his family suffered and he died. Is that the right thing to do? The patient comes before all of those things. No matter what anybody tells you, your contract is with the patient. And don't ever forget that. That's a contract. That's what they believe. That's what they want you to do. The next thing they want from you is the truth. Well, that seems obvious. Well, is it? What is the truth? They want you to do the best. If you haven't done the best, they want to know. If you can't do the case, they want you to tell them. How many people do that or do the case so they can make the money? Is that how you want to live? Is that what the patient wants? You're the patient. Ultimately, you will be the patient. Is that what you want? You have to be truthful with the patient. You have to be truthful with yourself. What is the truth? In the world we live in, do we really know what the truth is? If you pick up your newspaper, are you going to find the truth? Probably not. We live in a world where we've just had the virus. People have done work on the virus. We know in countries all over the world, there was scientific work that was done showing that drugs would be effective, but we were told they weren't effective. That was not true. How many died as a result of that? There were people in hospitals in the United States and Europe Russia, China, everywhere, who were working in the hospitals who were told that if they told the truth about what was going on during the virus, they would, they would be forced to leave. You know that's true. Is that what people are coming to you for as a doctor? So you don't have to tell the truth. That's not who I want to take care of me. I'm going to tell you some things that you don't hear much because people don't want to talk about them. But all over the world, people are being accused of racism. Everybody in this, in this conference call being accused of a racist, either because you're white or because you're this or you're that. That you make decisions based on color or race or the sexual pre prevalence or religion or country or politics. When we started the journal, Surgical Neurology International 10 years ago, I never knew who sent the article in. I didn't know what country they were from. All I did was to make a judgment based on the paper. Was it a good paper or not a good paper? If it wasn't good, but it was a good idea, we wanted to help you make it a good idea so everybody could read about it. It had nothing to do with what race or what you believed. Everybody has different things they believe in. Nothing wrong with that. There's no right answer. When I'm operating on a patient, when you're operating on a patient, I don't know what color the patient is. I don't know what his religion is. I don't care what his sexual preference is. My goal is to do the best I can for the patient. 
And I want everybody in the operating room to do that and everybody in the hospital to do that. I, none of these things mean anything to me. That's not important. The patient means everything. What's happening around the world? I used to, Tito mentioned, he was met me in Minneapolis. This is a man you've seen his picture all over the world, George Floyd. What is the truth? And all the pictures on the screen come from countries all over the world, China, Asia, Japan, Middle East, South America, North America. What was the truth? I've seen the videos. I looked into this. This is a man who was a criminal. He just was trying to pass bad money at a store. He'd been a drug addict. When he was taken out of his car, he was complaining, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. They wanted to put him in a police car. He resisted that, he was resisting arrest. So they got him on the ground and we saw a picture of a policeman kneeling on his neck. What you don't know is that was a common police accepted procedure. Why don't you know it? Because the day, the day after he died, they took it off the website so you wouldn't know the truth. That was their procedure. They had an autopsy performed. Do you know what that showed? What's the truth? The autopsy showed he had a lethal, a toxic level of fentanyl in his body, 10 times the normal dose. His lungs were consolidated. The pathologist said he would have died from that alone. But you didn't hear that because they didn't release that information till three months later. Why is that? Is that the truth? Is that what you're gonna do when you're a doctor talking to a patient? You're not gonna tell them the truth? You're the young generation, you're going to inherit everything. What are you gonna do about that? You want people to tell the truth or not? If you don't have the truth, you don't have a civilization. You have war. And so he said he couldn't breathe. And now we know why he couldn't breathe. Was there a crime committed? Well, they went to, to court. Did he get a fair trial? I don't think so. He was convicted before he even had a trial. Is that what you want? Is that how you would want to be treated in this world? I don't think so. Well, why do you accept it? And then what's behind it? You see in the slide here, something that says Black Lives Matter. And everybody around the world rallied for Black Lives Matter. You're a doctor. Black Lives Matter, White Lives Matter, Jewish Lives Matter, Catholic Lives Matter, Asian Lives Matter. All lives matter. But they don't want you to say that. All lives matter. That's what it is to be a doctor. It doesn't matter to you. And if you support that, where do you think that's going to get you? If you support the truth, where is that going to get you? Those are decisions you'll have to make because there are forces in the world trying to get you to deny the truth. That's why it's important. Does it matter? Yes, it does matter. If I'm on, if I'm on call, do I have to tell the truth about what's happening to the patient or do I cover it up? What kind of decision will my mentor make if I give him the wrong information, the wrong decision? The consequences are immense but people don't think about it. That's what it means. That's why over centuries, we have laws saying we must tell the truth. What are you gonna fight for? Are you gonna fight for the truth? Are you gonna fight for what's right in your life? I've had to do that my whole life. you want to think of bias, 
you know that I'm Jewish. For my whole life, I've struggled against bias. I couldn't get into schools because they didn't want Jews. I went into a residency where I was told at the end of the residency, well, my wife was anti-Semitic, I'm sorry. Couldn't get jobs. My ancestors have fought for 2000 years because they were Jewish. What about that? Do all lives matter or is it just black lives? And what do we find now? Anti-Semitism is rising across the world. Why is that? Because people accept it. Because that's not the truth. Is that what you want to do? Or is that what you're part of? I'm not. This is a saying. This came from a Lutheran minister in Germany. He was put in a concentration camp with 6 million other people, mostly Jews. And he said, when the Nazis came for the Jews, I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the people who wanted unions. So there wasn't in a union, I didn't speak up. Then they came for the Catholics. But I wasn't a Catholic, I was a Lutheran, Protestant. And finally, they came for me, but there was no one left to speak. That's what the end result is. Of not standing up for the truth, standing up for the patient. I've just written a book with a colleague. It's called the China virus. I've been to China many times, had the first meeting in the world in China, international meeting in neurosurgery. We name diseases after all the locations where they are, or the rivers or wherever they are. There's nothing wrong with that. The question in the book is what is the truth? We don't know the truth. We're not being given the truth. So the book goes through a chronology of what happens day by day, and you decide what you think the truth is. We don't tell you. Can you get the book? It's free. If you go to surgical neurology, it's sni.global. Go to the menu and go through the, the menu, and you'll find ebooks. It's free. You can read it. Everybody can read it. And make your own mind up. What is the truth? So getting back to the patient, the patient wants you to treat them like he's a member or she's a member of your family because they are. It's like they're your family member. What are you going to do? I was, uh, I was going to operate on a woman who was 60 some odd years old. She was from Mexico. I went to see her. There were 20 people in the room. It was her family. Her husband had died. She was the matriarch, the mother of the family. This is important in all of Latin America. I wasn't just operating on her. I was operating on the other 20 or 30 people in the family. It changed my plan. Because they were a member of my family. And I didn't want to leave her with any problem because she had a whole family to take care of. And those things are important to know. Some of you worry about success. What is success? I want to be successful. That's a simple answer. When I was working, there was a resident I was working in and he would be moonlighting. That meant he would be going uh, and working after hours in a, in a private office. And I asked him, what, is it, what, what does it take to be successful? And what he said and what I've learned is all you have to do is say that you and do, that you care for the patient. And if you tell people and people know and the word spreads by mouth that you care for the patient, you'll never have to worry about having patients. They'll come to you. You'll never have to worry about money. But if you put money first, you're more interested in money. 
you'll lose the patient. You'll probably wind up being divorced. Your children will wind up being greedy and your life will be a misery. That's a choice. That's a lesson. What's the final lesson? There are religions all over the world. I talked about that earlier. I talked about how we are, we, what our origins are. We don't know. Science doesn't know. We're not going to find out in our lifetime. But there is a principle. As when people gathered in a, together in civilizations, and they maybe had a certain person they elected as a leader, they all had certain things to do. And there was one fundamental principle that says, do unto others as you would do want done unto you. It is a simple, fundamental principle in all of life. Do people do that? No. Most people do. Most of the people I see around the world, the common person, yes, they do. That's what they want. That's what they want from you as a doctor. Do unto others. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter if you think you're an atheist. That doesn't matter. If you don't believe in doing unto others what you would want done unto you, can you have a civilization? The answer is no. There are fundamental things, principles here. Can you let the truth be corrupted? No. That's not what you would want done to you. Why are you doing it to somebody else? What about this? When you're born, you don't know what's good and what's bad. You learn. And some people wind up in life being optimistic, looking for the positives. And some people are critical, looking for the negatives. It's this bad. I don't have this equipment. I don't have this that I want for the patient. Or you're not doing your job. That's your choice to make. You can either believe in good in people, which I believe, or you can believe that people aren't good. The young people today have grown up because they've had, they've had some harm done to them and they can't trust people. And they have relationships they try to have with each, with each other. And they're not, they're trying to find somebody they can trust, somebody they can believe. And I just told you why they can't, because the truth isn't out there. So it's your choice to make. Nobody does it for you. Do you want to believe that things are going to get better and then you're going to work to make them better? Or are you going to think that they're not very good and you won't work for anything? That's a choice. You make the choice. Nobody makes it for you. You do. What do I, what, what do you have now in this call that I don't have? When I started, there were no computers. There were no cell phones. I had to go to the library and look through the books and the journals. And before my time, they didn't have that. Now I can have a world of information on my desktop. Incredible. I can instantly communicate like we're doing now. And I can have a real time discussion like we're going to have. So I didn't have those things. You have those things. That's an incredible gift. How are you going to use it? So what did we do? We started a journal, Surgical Neurology International. It was a journal that was free. We went all over the world. We found people couldn't afford to go to meetings. They couldn't afford journals. They were charging too much money. And so we made it free. And you were articles from people all over the world. We publish articles from more countries than probably any other journal in our field and probably any other, any other journal elsewhere. Because it didn't matter to us. And you just go to sni.global, put that in your computer, and you're there on the website, that's the home page. 
and you can have an encyclopedia. You can have a whole library of information about neurosurgery on videos and everything that you can have. It's all free, 24 days, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year long. That's what people want. We started something new. So people want more than that. They want to be able to sit down and talk to each other, just like I did over the past 60 years when I went to all the countries. We talked to people. I learned tremendous amounts from, from all of you. My wife and I learned a tremendous amount. We learned about life. Life's more than neurosurgery. So we had a meeting, a thousand people registered, or almost 600 people came. We had a meeting that was discussion. We had 57 speakers from all around the world discussing the very cases that you handle every day. What do you do for trauma? What do you do for a hematoma? What do you do for a spine problem? What do you do for pediatric tumors? What do you do for this? And we heard that the experts even differed. That's what we know. Nobody's right, nobody's wrong, they differ. We respect that and we learn from it. So what are you going to do with your life? Because I just told you, we're handing you this civilization with all the good and bad parts. What are you going to do with your life? Well, some people sit down and they say, well, we're the smartest people in the world. I have an answer for that question from all the places I visited. There are smart people all over this world. They're not just in the United States. They're not just in Europe. There are very smart people in very poor places. Very, very talented people. We need to hear from those people. You don't need to go to the United States or Europe. You're sitting with very smart people. Learn from them. Then I'm asked, where's the best neurosurgery in the world? And some people think it's all oh, it's in the United States or it's in Europe. It isn't. It's all over the world. One of the first operations for carotid endarterectomy was made in South America. It didn't have anything to do with the United States or Europe. Stereotaxis was developed in, the, in, in Sweden. In Russia, they developed catheterization and they could put in balloons and coils that we now treat aneurysms in Russia. The man worked very hard, Dr. Segalov, in the laboratory to do that. He didn't have all the modern equipment, but he did it. And this happens all over the world. But some people from the high income countries want to make you think that that's where the best is done, and that's not true. The best is what you make it. You can be the best. You do the best you can with what you've got. That's what you do in life, no matter where you are, even if you're in a high income country. You have to do the best with what you have. And if you don't make use of everything and you're a high income country, I don't have much respect for you because I know people who don't have anywhere near what you have, who have done much more in their life. And I respect those people. And I look around and I see the young people and I see they complain about they can't have this or they can't have that. And for me, this is the greatest opportunity I've ever seen in my lifetime. If all the people around you want to be mediocre, want to be average, and you want to be the best, you work to be the best, and it'll make you feel like you're just wonderful, and you're, you feel great, and you're going to be a happy person, you're going to make your wife happy, and your family happy, and all the people who touch you happy. Because you're going to take advantage of life's great opportunities. They come every minute, every hour of every day. You have to be the best person you can be. What are your goals? You're not going to get anywhere unless you have goals. If you don't know where you're going, you're not going to get there. How do you reach your goals? It's simple. Can you dream? Yes. 
You should dream. You should think of the things that you'd like to accomplish and then find a way to accomplish them. Hi, here's what, how you do it. You learn from medicine. There's certain principles. Patient comes to you with a problem. You take a history. You do a physical examination. You get the lab work. You talk to the patient. You get your data. And then you go home. And now on the internet, you can do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the world library. And you study and you read about what the patient's problem was. And you read of what other problems can be like that. That's your research. Some people say they don't like to do research. That's what research is about. That's what it means to go to the lab, is to learn what I'm thinking about. Then you come up with a differential diagnosis. And you test one out, you test another out, and you make a treatment. That's what medicine, you do that every day. You're going to do that every day of your life for the rest of your life. You're going to use that formula. Well, what about life? It's no different. If you leave the operating room, I've seen people who go to the committee meetings and it, they, don't, they don't even think anymore. The principles are the same. They are faced with a challenge or a problem. You have to go out and get data just like we do from patients. You have to read and learn about it. You have to come up with some choices and you make a solution. This is a principle you will lose, use through your whole life. You'll use it when your children talk to you about the problems they face in the future. When you're in your business, when you're working with your colleagues, it's the same principle. It's a logical principle. You're learning it every day if you're doing it right. And some people will say, oh, I can't do this, or everybody I talk to, and, uh, the answer is no. I know all the reasons why it can't be done. Now go find a way to do it. You want to be the best you can be. Are you going to be like everybody else and say no? You're going to find the answer. Create the answer. Work for the answer. Because in the end, you deserve what you get in life. And if you want to be a person who's pessimistic, that's what you're going to get. If you want to be a person who doesn't look for the good in people, looks for the bad, that's what you're going to be. If you're not going to look and work for the patient and think about other things like money, that's what you're going to be. Greedy. If you're not going to be devoted to the truth and stand up for the truth, you're going to be a liar. Is that what you want? I don't think so. And if you want to make an excuse that, well, it's better in the United States. I know people in the United States and they aren't very happy because they haven't done the things that you can do anywhere in the world to be the best they can be, to be happy, to be positive. That's their problem. In life, you, everybody gets what they deserve. So your future is up to you. It isn't up to me. I've had my chance. It's up to you. What are you going to do with this gift? Maybe a little different, you think about that now. Well, and I've had some people write me about what they really would like and what are their problems when they're young. What are the solutions for those? What are the solutions today? We're trying to solve a problem, which is to get you experience from people who know things. I'm not the only older person in neurosurgery. There are many of them. They have all very good ideas. Listen to them. If you don't want to listen to history, you're doomed to fail because you'll make the same mistakes over and over again. I have people who send us articles who don't want to go back and look at the literature beyond 10 years. They miss all the pertinent information, all the important information. They're not getting the truth. You have to work for it. So how do we get people, young people around the world want mentors. They want somebody that they can follow. What's the solution for that? 
I'm going to ask you when we're in the discussion period. I'm going to ask you, what's your solution for that? So if you have anything you want to write me or talk to me about, that's my email address. Write me, I'll write you back as soon as I can do that. It doesn't matter where you live in the world. Be happy to help you. That's what I want you to do for everybody else with your life. I came into the world and the, what I wanted to do is to leave the world better off than I came in. I think I've done what I wanted. I want you to do the same. So we can build a civilization, build people, do better. That's what it's about. So those are the 13 most important lessons I learned. My name and my background isn't important. And I want to thank you for listening. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Perilla. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Ausman, because in your conference, you show your soul that I say from the beginning. And you take us how is the right way for be really honest with the patients and in with ourselves. This is the most important lessons that we have to learn. That we is in our cell, is in our work, is in our feelings, that is in our principles that we have conducted all our profession. If we have to take out all arrogance, all feelings, and only think that we are decided to be neurosurgeons, medical doctors for help to the patient to take care of the pain. And this is all because the life are in other hands. So we must to do it. All these uh, advices, if we think with one honest salt and generosity like you are show for 60 years in medicine and will be probably more successful. Thank you so much for give to us your soul, your life for the neurosurgery and also for share today with all these experience with all audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tito. So much and we can take one quick comment from Professor Suresh Nair before we move on to the second lecture. Professor Suresh Nair. Thank you, Raja, for giving me this great opportunity. Professor Osman, this was one of the best ever lecture I have listened in my 40 years as a neurosurgeon. And the message you gave that one should be patient-centric. Patient comes first and we should be honest and truthful to the patient. And next point you told that all lives matter. What is, what, what better word, sentence than this? And that is a precise thing we got from you. All lives matter and one should always support truth and fight for truth. You told us about the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them unto you. Absolutely correct. And, and lastly, you told that all the patients should be treated like our family member. And it is the attitude of somebody which decides one can be the best with what one has. We don't have to be rich or anything. And you also told that answers can be found for all problems. And future, our future is up to us. What a great lecture, Professor Rospan. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Before we move on to the second lecture, may I kindly inquire with Professor Osman, would you be staying back for the second lecture?
I, I think so. I have a, another Zoom conference to go to, but I, I think I'll do that. Right. Thank you very much. We have Professor Mitsuhito Mase with us. Professor Mase, can you please on your video? Yes, Professor. Thank you very much for joining. Professor Mase, you have done with your introduction part, and I will hand this platform over to Professor Ahmad Ammar, who would say a short introduction and invite Professor Mase. Professor Ammar, all yours. Yeah, it is, uh, it is a pleasure to uh, attend actually this uh, webinar. And I, uh, before I talk any words about uh, Professor Massey, but I would like really to thank uh, uh, Dr. Osman for what he uh, taught us. I think this is, for me, it is one of the most important and wonderful lecture I ever listened to. Now I think that is Professor Massey from Nagoya. He is the president of uh, uh, Nagoya University Hospital, and he is also the chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery in Nagoya. I have a personal affection for Nagoya because Nagoya was the place of uh, my mentor and teacher, Professor Sugita, and I visited Nagoya several times. And another reason that is the, the Dr. Massey, he has a, a long reputation in neurosurgery, vascular neurosurgery, endovascular neurosurgery, and in research lab, and he published hundreds of papers. And he is going to talk to us today about the CSF physiology and CSF dynamics. I think this is a very, very important subject, and I'm sure all will learn something from him. Please, this, Professor Massey. Thank you very much for, for introducing me. Uh, it's a great honor and a great pleasure for me to, in, to attend this uh, webinar. So uh, uh, I start my lectures, okay? Uh, so the title is my talk is a uh, CSF Physiology Upgrade and Feature Subject. And so this is a very famous picture by the Kusin, Harvey Kusin. He wrote the, the, the third circulation as a, uh, the CSF circulation as a third circulation. So circulation, the term circulation, is this correct? I wonder, you know? This, in case of circulation, for example, there's a blood circulation. So blood circulated, of course, you can agree. And also lymphatic circulation is also. But is it true of the CSF circulation? I tell about this first. So first you think about the what is the CSF. So the CSF, of course, you know, the fluid in the subspace space and also ventricular and central canal. It's uh, maybe the, it's the CSS named as a fluid in the certain spaces, you know. So in that case, this is the same as a blood, you know. Blood also a name of the fluid in the vessels. So please watch this picture, you know. This is uh, the right picture is, uh, you know, running pool, running water pool. This is the model of the model blood. So this is the water is circulating blood in the men is and you know, ch children are the, the uh, you know, cells, the blood, dead blood cells, and something like that. And the left side is a CSF model, you know. But like I said, blood, blood model is circulated, you know. The, the water is circulated, so maybe blood model, blood circulation is okay. But in case of CSF, in the past, it's believed that the produced in the product plexus and to the absorbed in the alcohol viri is one direction. Is it circulation? And also, the, but now that we know the, uh, the production and absorption also down in the capillaries also. Also, the another uh, drainage pathway exists in the lymphatic drainage system. So it's not, it's, it's, it's not one way, it's very, it, much complex, you know. So is it saturated? It knows there's no saturation in, in, in case of CSF. So we all also said in textbook, and you know, that production rate and absorption rate with CSF can you calculate correctly because uh, you know if the blood in the case of blood circulation no one say about or no one think about the blood production rate or blood absorption rate blood is only the fluid in the vessel and the in the in, in the interest is uh, the how, how, amount of the dead blood cells and content and molecule uh, uh, and extra something like that in the content that the blood is important and blood itself is not it's, it's produced or the absorbed. It's the same as CSF. So now we cannot say also that in the CSF, we cannot say the production data and absorption rate, but there's many, many data on the textbook. 
but you know you you have already know that the fact that that shows that she is a production from the site other than corpus for example if you do the characterization of all the processes how the cells cannot be controlled in all cases also and uh, she has a formation rate of the peroxotomized group is on 70 percent of the normal so still the, the CSA exists. And the chemical composition of CSA did not change after colpectomy. So it's so it is clear it's uh, that CSA comes from not only the colpectomy. And in the textbook, there's many texts still written in the CSA formation rate is uh, 0 0.34, 0 0.4 meter per mi minute. It's a total a day, about 50, 50, 500 meters a day. But is it true? Because the, it, the data is obtained in the very, very old, old years, you know? So very difficult to measure the true value now, I think. For example, this is a, the method reported in, in, in the, the, these 100 years of, of the major method of the CSC production date and something like that. The old, you know, papers showing the same, near the same data. However, I can't explain exactly the each the method, you know. Uh, these uh, old measurement is uh, based on the uh, classical uh, classical theory. This means all the, the CSS produced from the ventricles go through the aqueduct and go out for the surface of the brain and, in, and absorb it in the aqueduct brain. Now, it is it's completely different circulated, uh, different flow is, uh, is obviously we, we have shown, already we know the, in, in the CSA dynamics. So the, the beginning of this change has, uh, for, uh, uh, beginning from this change has started from Kracha, you know, the, the doctor Kralika and he's a, uh, you know, a pharmacologist. He did the experiment using the cat and he inserted the, the cannula in aqueduct here and then occluded the aqueduct okay, completely. And then from the tube, the CSFs are only pulsated, no outflow from the tube, just pulsating. And they, they concluded the, 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 uh, you know, the classical theory, flow circulation theory is wrong. And in his paper, he hypothesized that all CSFs come from the capillary and also the capillary. He explained that in the arterial capillary, during the hydro hydrostatic pressure make the the fluid flow into the brain and also the in the venous side of the, the uh, capillary, uh, the driving force of the pressure is go out to, out to the brain, the fluid, but it is not complete. It, it is incomplete. So he didn't, he didn't, ex he can't explain all, all the situation. For example, this situation, here is the obstructive hydrocells. So can you explain it? Because uh, if the, why, why the ventricle in Dutch, because most of the neurosurgeons think the, the, the CSF is produced in the ventricle and the plexus, so the increase the amount of the CSF enlarges the, the, the ventricle and the obstruct size of so occur. But if the uh, uh, production rate is uh, 0 0.3 or 4 milliliter per minute, maybe within one or two hours, this patient will die because of the, the balloon you know, rupture like this. But this is a cause of misunderstanding. I can answer later why the ventricle in, in enlarge, even if it is not circulating. So now that we know many, uh, based on many data, blood flow circulation theory is already denied. And so now she does not flow like this. Like this means that, you know, from the, uh, uh, in the ventricle produced in the corpuses, goes to the aqueduct in the post ventricle, but then the can go to the surface of the brain and absorb the inner aqueduct. It's not true. So of course there is another misunderstanding, uh, you know, evidence. This is the, this is the you know, the, the uh, chronological change of the, the you know, the ally uh, are just injected in in uh, uh, intrathecal injection. After then, this is the systemography. So everyone knows all the tracer go go to the ups, upper to the spinal cord, cervical space, and go to the brain surface in, and and absorb in the acromion brain. But you can change your mind, you know, you can see only the diffusion of the tracers. High ratio activity means it's, it's not absorption, it's the another, uh, you know, explanation is congestion of the tracers. So this means that it is not identical to absorption of water of the CSF. 
So now we can uh, we can directly see that uh, you know the real time movement of the shear series is MRI. So this is a time slip method uh, the, the devoted by Dr. Yamada in Tokyo University, and he showed uh, you know the direct uh, moving of the the water molecule doubled in uh, you know uh, here like this and uh, all within four four second you know he, he, the doubled water is go go in the third ventricle go to fourth ventricle it's very large quick movement also the, here is the doubled water in vessel system going to the unconsistent un like this this is within within second you know within several seconds very very quick and large movement is not uh, completely same as the classical theory the, the CSF flow. There's the another picture shows that this, the, uh, the labeling is uh, set in the third ventricle and the turbulent flow in, in the lateral ventricle through the mondo and also turbulent flow into the okay, through the arcade to the fourth ventricle. This is this, the turbulent flow movement in, in a cerebral fissure like this, but no movement of the drain surface cells are here, no movement of shear cell. So now we think firstly, uh, it, 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 the movement is, is the CSF, but we think about the movement of water market itself. So now from now, we, see, we I say about the water in the brain and water in CSF. So water is equal to CSF. No, it's not equal to CSF. So the movement of water molecules already studied for more than 50, 50 years. You know, this is the, the basic theory that the uh, H2O PET, you know. So using the dog, the extraction rate of water from arterial blood to the, the brain is on, by only single class. It's more than 50% of the molecules go into the brain. And also you, you, using, using the primate, you know, more than 90% of the water molecule is is uh, from from blood to the the brain through the capillary on by only single pass. So based on much more interesting data is already published in the well, 40 years ago. So you know extraction of the water is negatively correlated to the blood pressure or the cerebral blood flow. It is it is it is okay, but uh, but most most interesting is the extraction seem to be unaffect, unaffected by the state of the blood brain barrier. You know. So this curve is, you know, there, there are many points here. So the black circle is a seda, and if you inject the seda, if you inject the, the two more urea, it's a high, high molecular solution. And this is the water, very, very low molecular solution. And also the, in case of the, you know, the inverted the triangle is seda after BV damage, all the points is on the, on the one curve, you know. This means that the movement of water is not affected to the existence of BBB or disruption or anything. So, and, and, and also osmotic pressure. So from this, from this experiment, so movement of, of, of water molecule is you know, very, very fast and quick. And nearly 9% of water molecule is started from the artery to brain by only a single pass. Based on this, you know, the theory, we can measure the CBF of using the a 2 pet. So, so I, we do recently the dynamic PET study using H2O15 like this. Okay, so the half half time of the water molecule O15 is about two minutes, but we can measure the more than ten minutes using the correct uh, correction. Uh, so we set the ROI in gray matter, white matter, basal ganglia, and also the CSS spaces, the ventricle like this. And the the uh, observed the time 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 the activity curve like this. So here the 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 yellow and yellow is the basal ganglia and the the, the brown is uh, uh, gray matter. So steep increase in uh, the first peak is within the fifty second after the injection of the venous. So this this means. Uh, very quick, uh, you know, water molecule uh, is go into the brain from the, the artery by only single pass, and then gradually decreases the activity like this. This is around you know 12, 30 minutes, and then the black one the whole brain. The gray matter is gray, gray curve. It is a little bit uh, delayed from the gray, the curve of the, the curve of the you know uh, gray matters, but in, interesting, these curve is already collected the. the, and the this uh, the pink cur pink curve, you know, is uh, uh, the radioactivity in the prefrontal system. And also, the brown, the, this dot is 
uh, showing the, the increase of the reactivity of the, the uh, serum fissure. And also the lateral ventricle is a brown dot, uh, uh, black dot. And the end of the measurement, it's interesting, you know, uh, compared to the, the white, uh, whole brain, in the lateral ventricle, nearly 30% of the, uh, the activity is observed. And this means the, uh, very quick uh, water molecule movement, all, not only in the brain, in also in the, in the CSS space also. And also, prepotential serum fissure is larger compared to lateral ventricle. This means uh, these water molecules not come from the lateral ventricle, so the aqueduct just directly from the brain surface, you know. Brain, brain, brain surface, the cervical space, water molecule is, is uh, existing. This is very inter, inter, uh, interesting result. But it's not only by us. This is the, uh, the, the, the other report by Niigata University in Japan. They used the, the cold isotope and measured the, the movement of the H2O17 using the 7 Tesla MRI. So, and in this case, uh, they, they, may, they measured the activity of the you know, the uh, H2O17 signal entities here. This is the wild type of mice. And this, the second graph shows the uh, knockout mice of the aquaponin one. And this is a knockout mice also, knockout mice aquaponin four. So aquaponin one exists in the color of Texas. So if the CSF uh, water molecule in CSF spaces come from the color of Texas, maybe if aquaponin one knockout mass cannot, may show the different pattern here. But this is the same pattern compared to the wild, wild pattern, wild, wild type. But uh, in case of the aquaponin for knockout mass, there's a completely different, you know, the pattern. This means the water molecule initiatives come from, not through aquaponin one hole, but also, but, uh, but, but, but aquaponin four. This means that all the, this water molecules is, uh, come from capillary is completely uh, supporting the the critical theory. So now water is not equal to CSF, and movement of water molecule is pass pass free and bidirectional. You know. So next next problem is which factor regulate and control the water movement and distribution, and what is the mechanism of the existence of CSF in ventricles and cervical spaces. So. And I, this is the answer. The most important factor is osmotic pressure. The many different osmolite in different CSS spaces. So each area has a different content. For example, in the ventric and on the cervical space, the lumbar is the, the you know the content of the, the uh, content in CSS is a bit different. So what the water molecule moves only passively, just uh, to keep the uh, osmotic pressure equal. So the content of the CSS keep that control uh, the, the fluid volume and distribution of ventricle and circle spaces. So this is a the very, very interesting example. So here, the, this is the very, very, very strange mo molecule, protein is secreted from the alkaline membrane. We call this the process and desynthesis. The other name is beta -tress. This protein has a, a function of the, the, the carrier protein, however, they keep the water in cervical space also. This is very interesting. So now CSS does not circulate and true CSS production rate uh, or volume are unknown, I can say. So, but maybe you, you, you can see where CSS has come from and gone, but we have to answer, I have to answer. So it comes from the vascular system. It's, it's completely, you can agree with this. So it, 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 I think this, there's no objection so all the fluid we, we call now the neural fluid, including every fluid in in CSS in the central nervous system. You know? so neural fluids come from uh, blood vessel through blood brain barrier or blood cord uh, barrier here. So in that itself is maybe no objection, I think. And once go into the brain on the CSS space, the molecules is just uh, nearly relatively freely go. Uh, exchange uh, just between uh, in interstitial fluid, extracellular space, and ventricular CSF, and cervical spaces, so P and ependymia. Okay, but still in in the text, but, you know, it's, it's a little bit uh, complicated in, in in the capillary brain capillary. There's a tight junction, and in, in this makes the endothelium virtually non-permeable to water. 
I doubt this sentence. Maybe water must be uh, go through BBB freely, I think, but I, I don't know many, many written this, this description in, in the text. And in, this is uh, this is in a uh, uh, ependymal layer. Epen in, in ependymal layer, uh, the textbook also says uh, say, says that the relatively free movement of shears is through this membrane, but still there's a B BCB, a blood corpus barrier that restricted this water movement. I don't know it's true, but maybe detected sometimes uh, so, some extent, but uh, not completely dis uh, district, I think. So the formation is okay, but the the most problem nowadays is the exit. You know, drainage route is important. So we, this this is not uh, clarified fully. So, but now we know the two exits of the neural fluid is exist. It's and its content. One is venous drainage, the other the lymphatic drainage. So, so venous drainage is just go through the BBB or BCB to the blood vessels. It's, it's maybe everyone can and agree with this. The other uh, route is lymphatic drainage system. I have to explain lymphatic drainage system precisely. So that again, this is the, there are many, many drainage pathway, it's just the pathway and capillary, colored vessels and also alcohol all these is a, is a final venous drainage. But it, once vein surgery observes it, imagine the situation. For example, sinus thrombosis, dural area involving CSS. In that case, brain swelling occur, ICP increase, no ventral dilatation. So this is not called uh, hydrocephalus. So the other drainage route may be meningeal lymphatics, perivascular space near the lymphatics, nabrucis. These are all we, uh, we call lymphatic drainage system. So venous drainage occlusion is not cause of the hydrocephalus. Maybe this obstruction is possible cause of ventricular dilatation, I think. So there are two lymphatic drainage systems now, you know. So one is a drainage route from directly from CSS space to the nasal lymphatics. And the second is a drainage route from the brain parenchyma, from brain tissue, in, to, to, from the interstitial fluid to the, 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 the lymphatic drainage system. This is the direct drainage route from the CSS space to the uh, nasal lymphatics. There's the hole, just the, you know, the CSS, CSS route from circular space to the lymphatic, lymphatic nasal lymphatics through this uh, also the bark and so on. And also the another route, the, 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 the institute fluid in the, the uh, waste and large amount of large molecule, molecules is cannot be uh, washed by the capillary, just just along the capillary in the wall of the arteries, it's go to do the uh, pro the, the opposite direction to the uh, along the artery to the cervical lymph node. No, so why these lymphatic no, lymphatic drainage system should be exist is the there there are many many large molecule uh, waste uh, the the metabolites in the brain and the CSF spaces should be washed out from the CSF central nervous system, but all large, large waste of metabolites or, or the insoluble metabolites cannot be uh, washed out through the capillary. So we have to drainage directly from the CS or the brain tissue, not through the capillary. So, so you can, you, you know well, but this disappears on cerebral hemorrhage. So you, if there is no lymphatic drainage system, all the cerebral clot should be absorbed through the cyclone biliary or the brain tissue to the capillary, we can't imagine, you know, within one or two weeks, all the clots is washed out and she should become clearly a little bit of antichromic, but you know, most of the clots should be washed out through the lymphatic drainage system. So very important. There's another theory of the waste of the drainage system in, in, from the brain nowadays. So this we call the, the lymphatic system. It's it, it proposed by the e, 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 Dr. Edi. So they hypothesize the waste of the high, high large molecules in the brain tissue is uh, the convective flow from the arterial space, perivascular space from the artery and go to the, the venous side and the wash out through to the perivascular space of the brain here. But this is, you know, the, the term of lymphatic system 
It's very, very attractive and very, very beautiful. So everyone believes this, this situation, but as there's, there's some debatable point and uh, 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 it should be uh, 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 reconsidered point. There's some, some the point. One is uh, the, what is the, the uh, you know, the uh, driving force of this convection black bulk flow. This is uh, maybe uh, it's not different uh, in the, this paper. They, not, they cannot uh, uh, prove this is not, this is, uh, there's no di difference between convection flow or, or diffusion. So this direction itself is, 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 is doubtful. But nowadays we uh, accumulation of data, you know, some, some of the washout system is proven and something is debatable, you know. Here is the brain, brain tissue here and just along the artery, along the artery, just into the arterial wall washout system, so, uh, this uh, to the cervical deep node is already proven historically. And also, Maybe that this uh, parabascular aspect here, you know, just around the artery and around the vein, maybe this space would be exist, but it's not unclear, you know, and all the contents, you know, the con contents is go just through the uh, go drainage along the vein system is debatable because. You know, now they, 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 they do this show that uh, present many papers, just the, the, the uh, lymphatic, lymphatic vessel exists just along, you know, near the, along, along the SSS. It's, it's, it's impressive also, but decent papers still say this like this, you know, this lymphatic vessel, this is, you know, around the bay, some ways go to the CSS space and directly to the lymphatic vessel. It's questionable. No, no proof of the historical. Uh, uh, it's not, it's not, it's not, has not been shown, so it's the, uh, it's questionable still. Also, there's a, you know we know that the alcohol barrier cells exist between the dura and the alcohol. So if the, 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 this kind of route maybe the just vein directly to the, you know, the, the bridging vein along the bridging vein might be, but it's not proven yet. But nowadays, but you know, the uh, large molecular waste is with, uh, with the water, is uh, drainage from the central nerve system. One is from the skull base to the lymphatic nasal lymphatics, and also the just along the artery to the cervical lymphatics. You know, this is already a problem. And also there be problem that existence of the uh, lymphatic the, the vessels just around, just in the dura, but from the, this cranial to the cranial, to the cranial dura, the, the root is not proven yet, okay? And, but uh, in the spinal cord, there's many, many uh, uh, epidural lymphatic network existence is a uh, problem even human. And also this root has already uh, historically proven. So from CSF directly through the dura matter and go to the uh, lymphatic para, para spinal lymphatic node, there's another root. So this is a maybe in, in case of the, you know, the, the human or primate might, might be the main root of the trainer system. For example, and the driving force of this trainer system uh, could be, uh, uh, you know, the respiration, negative pressure, negative pressure of respiration. And now that another new paper is, is, is a problem. It's, 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 it's not, it's, it's the, you know, not a primate, but you know, uh, in the skull base, skull base meningeal uh, lymphatic system exists. But during the operation, maybe you, you uh, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, encounter the, that heat and the uh, uh, membrane to the skull base during may, might be, uh, but I'm not it's true, but it, it might be in him also. So now this is a diagram. This is already uh, acceptable. A, di a diagram that the, the neurofluid clearance system in in central nervous system. So from, from the blood, the fluid fluid and content go to the interstitial fluid and also the CSF and also uh, in alcohol process also the the you know go to the CSS space and absorb it in the other direction. 
the other other direction, other drainage route is impacted system. The Arakuna Villa is is usually is not it's not used for the drainage system, just in case of the high ICP. And then fluid movement at the barriers are driven by the osmotic and hydrostatic gradient or by active transport process. It, it is many, many transport systems is shown. And fluid movement into and, out, into and out of the wheelchair loving space depend on the respiratory and cardiac pressure pulsation. Okay, so summary one, the CSF does not circulate as a classical theory. The CSF formation rate published before is wrong. Uh, CSF in different areas has different content. The turnover of CSF content is important and water molecule moves passively according to the distribution of the content and its osmolarity. So the, and so the subject for the further study is driving a force in the autogonic system and then a route from the brain parenchyma to the main limitic system near CSS is not shown yet. So the next, next uh, uh, talk point is the mechanism of ventral dilatation. So why the obstructed hydrosis occur, I have to explain to you. So, you know, the, the CSS does not circulate in like a classical theory. So bulk flow theory is not the, the cause of the ventricular dilatation. So how do you explain this situation? So our hypothesis is the prostate disturbance theory. So this is a module of the prostatal brain. Yeah, inside of the blue is a, this is the uh, CSF. So once brain pulsation occur, this pulsation is uh, just the reduced volume of the, the ventricle, and then green arrow is a reaction force. And uh, some of uh, some amount of the CSF will go out of the brain to reduce the pressure. But once this outflow of the CSF is, is obstructed, the CSF is not compared, the, the volume is not changed, it's not compensation, it's not compensated, the, the pressure. So the action force increased. So this is uh, on the outside the force and inside the force is different. Maybe brain is elastic, has a viscous elastic property. So ventricular wall is increased to increase the area. And you need, if, if the inside ventricular wall unit area uh, is force is equal to the outside, is, is stop the enlargement of the, you know, uh, ventricles. So in, in explain the text again. Interventricular CS can't move freely by brain pulsation. So no pressure compensation occur. This is obstruction. And the force to the ventricle wall in a unit area increases. Then ventricle direct to reduce the force of the wall in the unit area until the same level of the force from the brain. It's very simple, the physical theory. So based on the theory, the think about the, the in, in every case is of the hydrocephalus. So it, this is the case of, you know, uh, it, the, normally if the brain per se, usually brain exists in, in, the, in the cranium and in CSS, to, to CSS spaces, no pulsation generator is, is not so much exists. So usually in a systolic phase, the CSS go to the downward, you know, brain, uh, according to the, uh, the increased volume of the brain itself the, by the pulsation. But, and this is the you know, the, uh, the asteroid phase. But if arcade occlusion occurred, you know, CSF cannot go move to the downward. In that case, the reaction force increase. So the ventricle increase. But increase, enlargement to a scene, only lateral ventricle, side ventricle. Arcade and force ventricle, circular spaces are normal, not enlarged. So you can see all the obstructive currency in the posterior fossa. On the enlargement, you can see the lateral and the third ventricle, but no enlargement of the post ventricular surface spaces. So this is also the same loba. So it's on, on the enlargement of certain lateral ventricle. The other also spaces are not enlarged because of the obstruction side is accurate. The, another model is in, you know, the hydrocephalus caused by the cervical hemorrhage. This is in case of secondary NPH. So obstruction occur in the cervical space of just around the brain stem. So in that case, all the ventricular system including arcade enlarge, but no enlargement of the cervical space. Maybe you can see all the uh, hydrocephalus after uh, SH, no enlargement of cervical space, no enlargement of cerebral fissure, 
just embellishment all the ventricular system, including arcade act and post ventric. This is a this is a, a simple explanation of this endangerment mechanism. So the other model is you know INPH dash dash, you know. In case of NPH, enlargement of all ventral system and enlargement of the, you know, cervical spaces. So maybe this is speculation, but my, but maybe obstruction site is, you know, maybe lymphatic donor system. In that case, all the ventricle and all the CSS space should be increased. So maybe this is, a, uh, this, but only one thing is the, the different from IPH because it's not dash because uh, a part of the you know uh, salsa is not enlarged in case of dash. So this is also uh, explained by the other theory. There is a, the, another you know communication in the point of the fissure is is open and go to the the CS pulsation go to upward and so this type high convexity occur. This is, is but basically the obstruction site is you know the lymphatic system and the old ventricle and subcranial system as enlarged in this INPH model. So mechanism of ventricle dilation, we, say, we can say now the pulsation disturbance theory, this is our theory. Now, where is the obstruction? So think about the cause of the hydrocephalus. We always think of the, where is the obstruction site, you know? So then if you, you, you know the obstruction site, the central or proximal side of the CS, CS space and ventricle Ventricles from the pulsation generator must be enlarged. Must be enlarged. So, subject for further studies to the ventricle sites would be controlled by pulsation disturbance and context, osmoly. And control mechanism of D2 factor maybe should be uh, gratified in future, through the future study. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bersa, for this great work. It is provoking a lot. You know, this is a many, many points that is, I'm sure that is, there is a lot of debate, but it is very interesting theory. Uh, many people are shifting to it nowadays to see that the pulsating theory is more important and the bulk of the theory is going away. And uh, people started to recognize that is a rural of lymphatic system as a secondary or is important for draining and uh, all of this, but still, and about even uh, Harold Ricke came up years, two years or three years ago saying hydrocephalus means obstructed hydrocephalus, it must be obstruction somewhere. So there is nothing called communicating hydrocephalus mm -hmm. other than many people. So you mm -hmm. think you agree about this, yes, but agree. many people are still fighting for that and mm -hmm. the biggest examples the people, that's good to, to ask you our opinion about this. People are asking about, for example, after meningitis, when you have a hydrocephalus after meningitis, obviously there is no obstruction area, maybe as a, the bacterial debris or this hard molecule, which are absorbed by as you drained to lymphatic system or are kind of lie. So, in this case, shall we say the obstruction in the lymphatic system or what? I think so. So, we first use the obstruction, obstruction, how do say the obstruction between the ventricle and cervical spaces? Yeah. But all the hydrocephalus should have the obstruction site. So, community in the is the obstruction site is the you know, lymphatic drainage system, obstruction of the lymphatic drainage system. So, so, I think I agree with that. Okay, so for this also, because there are people now talking a bit a lot about it, or we started to recognize it, that is, you know, skull based approaches now, transnasal is common. Okay. And if according to the theory that is lymphatic system, especially the nasal one, which most probably damaged during this approach. Could be, but so I this is could be cause of dilatation of the ventricle, but this is we don't see. Okay, but How you can know, you explain? Maybe you know we have many many drainage root, you know. So yeah. of course the, the scar base is more, very very important for the, the rodent, you know. That and mice yeah. have very very massive nasal lymphatic system, but for human it's not the main root. I think maybe the, you know, uh, maybe the. 
Nabl cis root is a very, very important root, I think. So, uh, you know, do you know the situation the A beam, you know, asymptomatic uh, the feature of the, you know, uh, INPH, dash, dash pattern, but no symptom. So it's, yeah. it's become aging. And after follow up the, the A beam patient will become the 10% become INPH. So, it, uh, gradually the lymphatic drainage system is obstructed by aging, you know. So, yes. uh, and, and some person have some symptom. So, uh, if the patient who who is uh, nearly obstructed lymphatic system without no symptom, and then he received the scalpel surgery, might have have a possibility to have some uh, normal pressure hydrostatic symptom like that. But it's not main root for, for human, I think. Sorry. Yeah. Well, it is great talk, and I am, you know, I am, you know, I am very interested to this. My last question before we go, because I don't know if you saw my book about hydrocephalus, about say about idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. I wrote, and we made some study. I just tried to take a biopsy from the cortical and mm -hmm. subcortical area in the cases. And I found all the cases, they have clearly thrombosed capillaries in that areas. Oh, yes. And this is maybe support your ideas, support that, mm -hmm. that's going on with mm -hmm. this, because this is not only the dilatation, what we treat, but the cause and how this progressed, we should understand. Mm -hmm. I, I, so I think that is, use your idea supported exactly what I found in my research before. I'm really very grateful and thankful for this provoking uh, talk and we hope to see more and more of your work and we will communicate personally. I will be happy to communicate with you personally. You. If anyone has any more questions, the floor is open because this is a very provoking subject. Yes, of course, Professor Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, it's a great pleasure to hear that conference. I suppose we uh, listen to Dr. Ausman conference, but really I have to make some comments. First of all, if you remember, I am from Colombia. Dr. Salomon Hakim, who was the first man who described the, this syndrome, Dr. Ahmed, the normal, pressure hydrocephalo. Yes. I begin to work with him in my department for uh, 35 years ago. I am trying to find some reason that explaining me many symptoms of this disease. And I am very happy that here you, Professor Massé, because you are putting the finger in many things that we are don't care from the physiopathology of all hydrocephalus disease. Yeah, I want to remark three points. One, it's true. If you look one patient with normal hydrocephalus, you can see the ventricles is a little large, but if the clinic would correlate to, with the MRI, you have to see parenchymal edema that is through the diffusion from the ventricles to through the brain. And these mechanisms, you now almost are explaining with your theory. I agree. And also, if you saw today, in the skull base tumors, you get a low increase of ICP mm -hmm. and they have the time for the ventricles go. The problem is in the suaragnoid space because all increase of the pressure and in the suaragnoid space is blocking they don't have the mechanism for the, for the CSF going on and drainage. And this is the reason 
that today we are using a lot a cerventriclostomy for that kind of tumors. And you see in almost 30% of the cases is not working. And in 70%, yes, but if you, they, they don't decrease the ICP in the, the pressure in the suaragnoid space, the suaragnoid village doesn't work. And even you have, again, new communication. For this reason, I am very happy though, that you are working very serious in fine to the really keys of the other system that the brain use for get compensation. And also I am working a lot in the waveform core. And I can tell you the pressure in the CSF must be higher of the pressure in the blood venous. Otherwise the venous does it, will be come to the brain. And this is the important key that you are show us in that world. My congratulations and thank you because I enjoyed too much your research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. We have Professor Osman with us still. Not many of you know, but Professor Osman is a scholar in physiology as well. Professor Osman would like to comment on the CSF circulation. Professor James Osman. Right. Can you hear us, Professor Osman? Uh, yes. Would you like to come in? I enjoyed the talk very much. I think it introduced some concepts that that we uh, thought about in the, in the past, and you put them into uh, fact. Thank you. Thank you very much. My co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Singh. Thanks, thanks, Raja. Thanks, Professor uh, Masse, uh, for the nice talk. Uh, I just want to find out from Prof. What's your opinion regarding uh, why there is an excessive CSF in hydrocephaly and not microcephaly? Why the patient develop excessive uh, CSF in hydrocephaly in abnormal development of the brain? Uh, my second question, Professor, uh, do you think that gravity do play a role? Gravity do play a role in the CSF dynamic, which you never mentioned about gravity. And uh, my third question, Professor, do you think that in other organs of the body, do you have CSF-like fluid in other organs besides the central nervous system? Because you're talking about capillary fluid movement and into the lymphatic system. Do you think that such fluid also happen in other organs? My last question, Professor, do you think that the scoliosis and carry malformation are due to the abnormal CSF dynamic? Thank you, Professor. You will make many, many, many questions. So firstly, maybe your question is uh, in case of SS, uh, SS occlusion. In hydrocephaly, why, why there is an excessive uh, CSF in hydrocephaly. So, uh, you mean the uh, SSS occlusion may, does not call hydrocephalus, you mean? He's talking about hydranencephaly. Hydron? Hydranencephaly, Hydron. where the brain is destroyed and the brain is filled with fluid. There is no mantle. He's talking about that condition. Uh, I, uh, you know, the, you know uh, my... my uh, my concept of the, the importance of the venous drainage is, you know, this is one of the, the fluid drainage system and the central nervous system, but even if the obstruction, the, the, it's not become hydrocephalus, so that's what I mean. So it's not an uh, acute, acute uh, you know, um, changes. So in chronic stage, I can't explain, I don't know exactly. It's okay, I'm sorry, I can't catch this English correctly. And second one is uh, uh, maybe the, you know, gravity. Yeah, we Yes. Gravity, you know. Maybe you know that in, in the space, uh, you know, uh, uh, International Space Station, there's a, the, the change in the distribution of the water fluid in, in, uh, just just to, toward the brain side. So the, the astronaut have the, some, the, you know, the probably edema and, and also the, the visual disturbance and also and the swelling of the, you know, faces. So maybe the you know the uh, distribution of the water content in the body is uh, is is controlled in the one G on the Earth. It is so. Uh, if you go to the, the space or uh, low gravity area, 
the distribution of the water is completely different. And see, so we always, you know, the you know, standing and the walking at the time, we uh, many, many places go up to the brain. It's, it's, it's very, very uh, strong force is, is always, always keeping, uh, uh, you know, body and uh, everything is in, the, in, in a normal condition. So this, you know, maybe any shan system can cannot work in space, you know, I think, <laughs> just in, in, in on the earth. So maybe the another the another you know topic to uh, to control ICP in space in in, in, a, in, a, in a, the huge further subjects. Of course, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think I'll wind this up officially. Uh, both the lectures were really mind blowing and. Uh, uh, contrary to what we have been conventionally thought about CSF production and circulation, it was an eye, op eye opener. I would like to close this officially. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers of today, Professor James Osman and Professor Mitsui Tomase and the Chairs, Professor Tito Perilla and Professor Ahmad Amar for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. I would like to thank my co-host, Dr. Liu Boon Singh, and a special thanks to Professor Shubin, who has been supporting us from a long time, and he has enabled us for this webinar to reach a large, large audience in China. Today, we have 900 neurosurgeons uh, who are watching us live on all the streaming platforms like Zoom, YouTube, and WeChat. So until we all meet on the 31st of July for the next session of ACNS webinars. It is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you all for joining.